This video will be a wrap up of the last two videos. So make sure you've seen both videos. The first one is the repopulation postcards with the cabbage patches. And the second is the first movie, La Fea Shoe from 1896. This video was inspired by a post by KD, so shout out to him. This isn't a new idea, but it's interesting to revisit this concept now that more information is being discovered. Many thought that we were literally saying that we came from cabbages. This video will assist in explaining the last two videos. So what are these postcards referring to? It would seem that the postcards are referring to some type of recent seeding process or cloning process, meaning the cabbages are but a symbol, a symbol for rebirth, a symbol for the female genitalia, the similarity to the shape of a baby head, and the idea that humans were farmed in mass quantities, meaning that this is referring to some type of operation in which they were baby factories, babies being produced in vast quantities for some type of purpose. As many have mentioned, there is even a eugenics component to this, where specific phenotypes were selected depending on the goal at hand. With the Alice Guy films, we learned not only is the origin of movies shrouded in mystery, but that these first films were quite occult, using symbols to create a certain state of consciousness. This strange old film was used to promote the incubators at the Paris World Fair in 1896, so this operation must have some connection to the incubators. We have a reference that we'll go over later that's from this exact time period that discusses where they got these premature babies. Oh, and later we're going to discuss this movie that talks about all of this stuff. But I wanted to bring it up because it seems that the Cabbage Patch videos did so good that on Netflix, number 5 is Storks, and that movie is from 2016, so it's strange. Either people are watching it now and the AI has it up on the top list, or they recently added it, which is still interesting because there is some very blatant symbolism in that movie. I don't believe that timing is a coincidence. But before we get to that, are there any ancient references to any type of repopulation factories? We've made references to this before, but now is the perfect time to dive into the detail on the ancient symbol of Artemis, or Diana of Ephesus. Diana is the Latin name, and Artemis Greek. She was essentially the great mother goddess of fertility. Artemis, in classical mythology, is associated with the virgin goddess of the hunt, forest, and animals. But strangely, Ephesus being located in Asia Minor saw a great deal of oriental influence mixing with the Greek, creating an entirely new symbol. The Ephesians believed both Artemis and Apollo to have been born in a grove called Ortigia, which is also very close to the ancient Greek name for Ireland, Ogygia, the ancient land of forest, which would have been the birthplace of the first repopulation center after the flood of many ancient religious texts. So the Ephesians believed that their gods, the ones that they dedicated their entire lives to worshipping, were themselves born of an ancient grove, but not only that, they put an extra emphasis on the symbol of fertility, depicting their goddess with many breasts, or what looks like eggs, and her legs are held tightly together. In Strabo's geography, he states that, quote, On the same coast, Saliba the sea, is also Ortigia which is a magnificent grove of all kinds of trees, of the cypress most of all. It is traversed by the Kentrius River, where Leto is said to have bathed herself after her travail. For here is the mythical scene of the birth, and of the nurse Ortigia, and of the holy place where the birth took place, and of the olive tree nearby, where the goddess is said first to have taken her rest after she was relieved from her travail. Above the grove lies Mount Solmysis, where it is said that Curates stationed themselves and with the din of their arms frightened Hera out of her wits when she was jealously spying on Leto, and when they helped Leto to conceal from Hera the birth of her children. There are several temples in the place, some ancient and others built in later times, and in the ancient temples are many ancient wooden images, but in those of later times there are the works of Scopus, for example, Leto holding a scepter and Ortigia standing beside her with a child in each arm. A general festival is held there annually, and by a certain custom the youths via for honor, particularly 
and the splendor of their banquets there. At that time also, a special college of the Curates holds symposiums and performs certain mystic sacrifices." End quote. Her temple was in the ancient city of Ephesus, a great port city. This temple was one of the seven wonders of the world and was described as the largest temple or building of antiquity. This ancient structure served as a place for cult worship with mystical rituals involving sacrifice to this multi-breasted goddess of divine fertility. This temple was not only a religious center, but an economic center. It was an essential bank as no one dared to steal from a holy place. It was supposedly the largest bank of its time. The temple was rebuilt multiple times throughout history. A variety of different versions were said to have been constructed as it was destroyed by many different invaders, including Christians who tore it down to remove all pagan remains. These seeding operations were not limited to one location. Yet, many legends refer to this idea of the mother goddess and her children, for many of these histories have been disguised in the form of myth. In Plato's most prized work, Timaeus, he reveals the secret of cycles and resets of advanced civilizations, and that there have been more than one deluge. Quote, In the first place you remember a single deluge only, but there were many previous ones. In the next place, you do not know that there formerly dwelt in your land the fairest and noblest race of men which ever lived, and that you and your whole city are descended from a small seed or remnant of them which survived. End quote. Now, at first it may seem as just a literary device, but the term seed is used again in Timaeus. Quote, Solon marveled at his words and earnestly requested the priest to inform him exactly in order about these former citizens. You are welcome to hear about them, Solon, said the priest, both for your own sake and for that of your city, and above all, for the sake of the goddess who is the common patron and parent and educator of both our cities. She founded your city a thousand years before ours, receiving from the earth and Hephaestus the seed of your race, and afterwards she founded ours." End quote. Later in Timaeus it gets very alchemical and begins describing the creation of man using the same terminology. Quote, the bones and flesh and other similar parts of us were made as follows. The first principle of all of them was the generation of the marrow, for the bonds of life which unite the soul which the body are made fast there, and they are the root and foundation of the human race. The marrow itself is created out of other materials. God took such of the primary triangles as were straight and smooth, and were adapted by perfection to produce fire and water, and air and earth. These, I say, he separated from their kinds, and mingling them in due proportions with one another, made the marrow out of them to be a universal seed of the whole race of mankind. And in this seed, he then planted and enclosed the souls, and in the original distribution, gave to the marrow as many in various forms as the different kinds of souls were hereafter to receive. That which, like a field, was to receive the divine seed, he made round every way and called that portion of the marrow brain, intending that when an animal was perfected, the vessel containing the substance should be the head. But that which was intended to contain the remaining and mortal part of the soul he distributed into figures at once around and elongated, and he called them all by name, marrow, and to these, as to anchors, fastening the bonds of the whole soul, he proceeded to fashion around them the entire framework of our body, constructing for the marrow, first of all, a complete covering of bone." End quote. Timaeus continues to describe in detail how the gods created us and uses a garden as a reference, which is very strange. At first you think he's just talking about God and the soul, and then he says, quote, But our creators, considering whether they should make a longer-lived race, which was worse, or a shorter lived race, which was better, came to the conclusion that everyone ought to prefer a shorter span of life, which was better to a longer one, which was worse, and therefore they covered the head with thin bone, but not with flesh and sinews, 
since it had no joints, and thus the head was added, having more wisdom and sensation than the rest of the body. But also, being in every man far weaker, for these reasons and after this manner, God placed the sinews at the extremity of the head, in a circle around the neck, and glued them together by the principle of likeness and fastened the extremities of the jawbones to them below the face, and the other sinews he dispersed throughout the body, fastening limb to limb. The framers of us framed the mouth, as now arranged, having teeth and tongue and lips, with a view to the necessary and the good, contriving the way in for necessary purposes, the way out for the best purposes, for that is necessary which enters in and gives food to the body. But the river of speech, which flows out of man and ministers to the intelligence, is the fairest and noblest of all streams. Still, the head could neither be left a bare frame of bones on account of the extremes of heat and cold in the different seasons, nor yet be allowed to be wholly covered and become so dull and senseless by reason of the overgrowth of flesh. The fleshy nature was not therefore wholly dried up, but a large sort of peel was parted off and remained over, which is now called the skin. This met and grew by the help of the cerebral moisture, and became the circular envelopment of the head. For our creators well knew that women and other animals would someday be framed out of men, and they further knew that many animals would require the use of nails for many purposes, wherefore they fashioned in men at their first creation the rudiments of nails. For this purpose and for these reasons they caused skin, hair, and nails to grow at the extremities of the limbs. And now that all the parts and members of the mortal animal had come together, since his life of necessity consisted of fire and breath, and it therefore wasted away by dissolution and depletion, the gods contrived the following remedy. They mingled in nature akin to that of a man with other forms and perceptions, and thus created another kind of animal. These are the trees and plants and seeds, which have been improved by cultivation and are now domesticated among us. Anciently, there were only the will kinds, which are older than the cultivated. For everything that partakes of life may be truly called a living being, and the animal of which we are now speaking partakes of the third kind of soul, which is said to be seated between the midriff and the navel, having no part in opinion or reason or mind, but only in feelings of pleasure and pain and the desires which accompany them. For this nature is always in a passive state, revolving in and about itself, repelling the motion from without and using its own and accordingly is not endowed by nature with the power of observing or reflecting on its own concerns. Wherefore, it lives does not differ from a living being, but it is fixed and rooted in the same spot, having no power of self-motion. Now after the superior powers had created all these natures to be food for us who are of the inferior nature, they cut various channels through the body as through a garden that it may be watered as from a running stream." End quote. There's more to cover on that, but to keep things moving, he's basically describing how our creators took one of our original forms and transformed it to be more of a material nature attached to the primal senses, no power of self-will, to make them less like gods. A very strange process in which the flesh attaches itself to the bones. But it's more than just some spiritual metaphysical explanation of how bodies are formed. But it seems to be some type of manual, as there are decisions that need to be made. The creators had to choose how long these beings would live, and it seems that the original seed had much longer lifespans. In the end, he explains that the seed is a womb. Also, it is clear he is making a distinction between God, who created the soul, and the gods, who had manipulated the physical bodies. Okay, this one is the last paragraph to go through, and it's important because it's the ending to Timaeus. Quote, Thus our original design of discoursing about the universe down to the creation of man is nearly complete. A brief mention may be made of the generation of other animals, so far as the subject admits of brevity. In this manner, our argument will best attain a due proportion. On the subject of animals, then the following remarks may be offered. Of the men who came into the world, 
Those who were cowards or led unrighteous lives may with reason be supposed to have changed into the nature of women in the second generation. Okay, wait, hold up. What is he talking about? Well, we will come back to this, but he's speaking of a great race of humans that were once androgynous. This is an ancient esoteric secret that is referenced by many Greek philosophers several times. So he is saying that these original humans turned into women due to their natures. Meaning these androgynous beings did not reproduce, and it also seems that they did not eat or drink at all, the original gods. And he continues, quote, And this was the reason why at the time the gods created us in the desire of sexual intercourse, contriving in man one animated substance and in the woman another, which they formed respectively in the following manner. So there you go. These gods, which remember, it's not the same as God, but these gods gave us sexual intercourse by design to make us more like animals. Quote, the outlet for drink by which liquids pass through the lung under the kidneys and into the bladder, which receives them by the pressure of the air emits them, was so fashioned by them as to penetrate also into the body of the marrow, which passes from the head along the neck and through the back, and which in the preceding discourse we have named the seed. And the seed having life and becoming endowed with respiration, produces in that part in which it respires a lively desire of emission, and thus creates in us the love of procreation. Wherefore, also in men the organ of generation becoming rebellious and masterful, like an animal disobedient to reason, and maddened with the sting of lust, seeks to gain absolute sway. And the same is the case with the so-called womb, or matrix of women. The animal within them is desirous of procreating children, and remaining unfruitful long beyond its proper time, gets discontented and angry, and wandering in every direction through the body, closes up the passages of the breath, and by obstructing respiration, drives them to extremity, causing all varieties of diseases, until at length the desire and love of the man and the woman bringing them together as it were plucking the fruit from a tree, so in the womb as in a field, animals unseen by reason of their smallness and without form. These again are separated and matured within. They are then finally brought out into the light, and thus the generation of animals is completed. Thus were created women and female sex in general. End quote. Now Plato is very secretive throughout this entire book and it would seem that the knowledge of the science and art of cloning hybrid creation would be a heavily guarded esoteric secret. This also is connected to the mysterious nature of the alchemist, which will have to be its own video, but this is connected to the creation of an artificial man. These were the greatest mysteries of the ancient world, and every occult author is elusive on the subject, hence the need for the philosopher's stone to decode the message. Although, it is also portrayed as an unknown mythical substance of turning base metals to gold. However, the symbols go deeper than just that. That will have to be for the next video. This video is about to go over some crazy stuff, but we just needed to start with Timaeus first. So who were these androgynous beings? How do men turn into women? Well, some of the Greek gods that they're referencing are actual beings that once existed. And they were androgynous in nature. They were extremely advanced beyond our comprehension because their souls were more seated in the head as described by Plato. It was by design that it had moved into the breast like other animals. Plato towards the end of Timaeus is actually referencing his symposium, which again is another symbol, but in this he reveals the secret of our past natures. Now this connects because the temple of Artemis Artemis herself is referred to as the multi-breasted goddess, Artemis being the wild woman of Greek mythology. Well, this Artemis symbol is another reference to the Amazons, or the race of humans that were only female and had become fully independent with no need for men. The Amazons were also referenced as the one-breasted women. This is very interesting as we discuss the distortion of the original Artemis symbol. Well, get this. The original temple of Artemis at Ephesus in mainstream history is said to have been built by the Amazons who brought their statues. Quote, then they, the Amazons, turned to Ionia and Aeolia 
and made provinces of them after their surrender. Here they ruled for some time and even founded cities and camps bearing their name. At Ephesus, also they built a very costly and beautiful temple for Diana because of her delight in archery and the chase, arts to which they were themselves devoted." End quote. Quote, Ephesus was thought to have been founded by the Amazons and their statues. Chosen from a competition among the most celebrated artists of the day, were dedicated at the completion of the Temple of Artemis around 440-430 BC. Roman copies of these lost bronze originals each show the figure of the same size and dress, with the right arm raised over her head, sometimes leaning on a spear." End quote. The symbol of the Amazon women, which is also a fertility symbol, which is also a repopulation symbol. It's everywhere in our modern culture, manifesting in a variety of forms. Here, you can clearly see that this depiction of Diana of Ephesus is not only an advanced Amazon woman, but she has a crown just like the Statue of Liberty. She is also holding a scepter, which is not just some type of symbolic reference, but an actual device that these beings once possessed. Think about it. Do you know when the Statue of Liberty was brought to America? Now I think there's a cover up to the story as well, as some of the early photos do seem to be photo manipulated. They say it was built in France, disassembled, and then they brought it to America to be reassembled. But the photos in France could certainly be fakes knowing what we know now about old photo manipulation techniques. Regardless of that, the official reconstruction date takes place in America between 1885 and 1886 which is the exact year that the incubators opened in France. Why was there this random allegiance between France and the United States? Oh, just to support liberty? While they were making these postcards at the same time too. Who does that, just sends over a massive statue like that for free? Well, maybe there's more to this story, and this is the exact period and location that a wave of immigrants made its way through Ellis Island. This was an entry point, and the Statue of Liberty is on a star fort, which in many star forts around the United States, as with Fort Sumter, they would import in mainstream history mass amounts of slaves to these forts. So this was not just for Liberty, as the Statue of Liberty is Diana, she is Wonder Woman, mixed with the symbolism of Prometheus, as the flame represents the birth and creation of a new order. Let's remember who designed the statue and during what time period. They would have known that this is an ancient fertility symbol and they've placed it right in our faces. Scholars say the Statue of Liberty is based off of Libertas, which is true, but both Athena and Artemis are used in very similar ways and both have cult followings. Libertas, which is based on the goddess of Athena Minerva, also an androgynous goddess, quote, the helmet is a symbol of the goddess as Athena Minerva, but as Liberty, or Libertas, as the Romans called her, her symbol is a distinctive red stocking cap. The Pileus, or Phrygian cap, said to be worn in ancient Rome by slaves who had won their freedom. In the Revolutionary Era, rebels in America and France wore this Liberty cap as a symbol of freedom from enslaving authority, and often raised it on a pole or pike as their standard. End quote. In short, many of our city seals have this symbol. Remember the owl from Promised Neverland? The orphans who were being farmed? These anime writers know a lot more than what they let on. The secret history of the Statue of Liberty is that it was designed by French Freemasons. Watch the waste management video if you want to know what they were up to with Sod or Sade and all that stuff, but yeah. These Freemasons got caught up being so blatant with their symbolism that there's this French book on this entire subject of their rituals and so they essentially hid the symbol of Artemis within the Statue of Liberty. Either way you have it, the symbol has dark origins. Quote, the Statue of Liberty represents the ancient Babylonian goddess of love and fertility, Ishtar. Ishtar is known as the mother of harlots because prostitution was part of her religious practices. She was worshipped as Astarte in the Middle East. Scriptures call her Ashtoreth, and she was known in Latin as Libertas, Liberty. 
Labertas was referred to by Cicero, a Roman historian, as the mother of harlots. Liberty in ancient times was associated with sexual freedom and temple prostitution. Historian R.A. Combs writes, harlots were social outcasts, so she was referred to as the mother of exiles. This later equated with the idea of immigration becoming the mother of immigrants. Ishtar means Queen of Heaven. The same title was given to Mother Mary of Roman Catholicism. It's well known that this was actually a Freemasonic ritual. Just type in Freemasons in the Statue of Liberty. They aren't even trying to hide that. They're just not going to tell you the full story. So, this is a goddess of fertility, the goddess of immigrants, and also the goddess of orphans or foundlings? For this exact same symbol of Diana of Ephesus, the multi-breasted goddess, the receding symbol is used for the seal of the foundlings. Why would the original foundling hospital use this as an image or logo or symbol to promote their organization? We have no question now. To the left of the seal, we have the ancient repopulation symbol of Artemis. Then to the right, we have the distortion or the illusion of liberty, which is the harlot in disguise. The baby is the creation born under Ishtar. And why is there a text reading help underneath? The inverted symbol on top being the Lamb of God or Mary, the symbol of the Rosicrucians to project for the sin they are participating in during this repopulation process. And so they wish to see this as some sort of necessary sacrifice. This foundling operation is directly connected to the incubators. In the Canada Lancet, there is a report in 1883, three years before the incubators, that describes in details where they got all these premature babies from the foundling hospitals. And it also uses some very interesting wording. Quote, baby incubators. There were giants in the earth in those days and there shall be giants in the earth in these days, to be seen not in sideshows merely, but on every hand that is. If a report which comes from France be true, and it is well vouched for, and if giant babies are the making of giants and giantesses, all will admit the importance of a good send-off. It is just as essential in raising men and women as it is in raising any kind of stock. Blood and scientific management are no less potent in one case than the other. Indeed, it would be a great blessing to mankind were some of the ideas acted upon by the raisers of good stock imported into the more important business of raising a superior race of men and women. The working out of the law of the survival of the fittest would receive fresh impulse. Much sickness, pain, and sorrow would be averted and the sum total of man's happiness would be immeasurably increased. But no such luck is in store for the human race. The weak and the sickly no less than the strong and healthy will continue to produce after their kind. Man's twofold nature is an insuperable barrier to the enactment of civil laws, restricting to any considerable extent the natural law of reproduction. Economic and social considerations will always outweigh considerations having regard to the welfare of the prospective offspring. All that science or government can do in the matter is to educate the masses into a more perfect knowledge of physical laws. But to return to the subject, Dr. Tarnier, a French physician attached to a foundling hospital, reports surprising results from certain recent experiments. This gentleman is said to have been grieved by the large number of children under his care who perished within the first six months of their life. While in this mood, a new idea occurred to him. If French chickens, he asked himself, can be raised by artificial means, why not French babies? He caused a box to be made, having glass slides and resembling an ordinary chicken incubator. It was furnished with a soft bed, placed in a dark room and kept in a temperature of 85 degrees Fahrenheit by means of hot water. In this baby incubator, he placed one of the infants a miserable specimen of the crying, colicky kind. The child was provided with a nursing bottle, and of course only fed at regular intervals. The child ceased its crying on the second day, much to the doctor's surprise, 
and never again cried for the space of the eight weeks it tentated the incubator. At the end of this period, it had the appearance of a healthy child, a year old. Encouraged by the success, Dr. Tarnier repeated the experiment with the like results. He then, with the permission of the hospital authorities, proceeded to construct an incubator capable of receiving 400 children, and in this he placed all the children in the hospital, 360 in number. All except two remained in the incubator six months. When they had to be removed, having outgrown their narrow beds, were it not that the facts are vouched for by a commission of 12 who made a report to the government that the results claimed might be deemed incredible. The average age of the infants when put in the incubator was 8 months and 3 days, the youngest being 12 hours and the eldest 11 months. The average weight of the 360 was 10 pounds. At the end of the 6 months, the average weight was 85 pounds, and all are said to have looked like children 8 years old. As much was accomplished in 6 months by the incubator as in accomplished in 8 years of ordinary life. The infants were not only large, but also strong and healthy, and most of them walked within a week of leaving their nest. The results were astonishing, and exceeded Dr. Tarnier's most sanguine expectations. It is now expected that every child's hospital will go into the incubation business, so that we shall probably witness a lively competition in the business of raising giants. If this children incubator is a good thing in foundling hospitals, and for hospital babies generally, it ought also to be a good thing in all homes blessed with babies. Doubtless, we shall soon witness a new industry started under the fostering care of the national policy, and presently, baby incubator agents will be as numerous as sewing machine agents. It would be easy to enlarge on the practical value and suggestiveness of Dr. Turnier's experiments. First. It is clear the babies were not rocked, yet they enjoyed perpetual repose. This teaches us that all the fuss and worry of mothers and nurses, so wearing to the constitution, is not only wholly unnecessary, but an absolute evil in all its bearings. Instead of being placed in a condition favorable to absolute quiet, our babies are made a sort of family toy to be tossed from one to another as means of sport. It's almost as if he doesn't understand that babies are family members and that people actually love them. Because then he says, the moment the little creature begins to notice surrounding objects, its powers are excited to the utmost to afford amusement to the family circle. In conclusion, we may be permitted to say that the essential conditions to successful baby raising are 1. Absolute quiet and no unnecessary interference on the part of the nurses. Two. Regular and judicious feeding. 3. Uniformity of temperature above that suited to adults. This condition is difficult of attainment in ordinary life, but much may be accomplished by the knowledge that infants require a higher temperature. Even modified observance of the foregoing conditions would take away much of the worry caused by crying and sleepless babies and would add greatly to the quiet, health, and growth of our children. It's all very strange, because it seems that they're treating babies as if it was a new thing. And he even compares French babies being grown by artificial means in comparison to French chickens. And this is the literal origin of the baby incubator, being that it was just an ordinary chicken incubator. On top of that, they said that they built these incubators on the side of the foundling hospitals, so they were connected. Why did the foundling hospital have all these premature babies? Did they find them? That doesn't make that much sense. Sure, you can say that the Catholic Church was taking babies, but even then, that's very suspicious. Why were they under six months old? Is it possible that they found a way to create babies, but it took them a while to figure out how to keep these prematures alive once rediscovering some type of ancient cloning process? The idea is that these foundlings were abandoned, that because they were unmarried, they had to give them away to these infant asylums. This is deeply integrated into the history of New York, but the history is not well known. Quote, Europe faced the problem of foundlings much sooner than the United States did. 
When America's British settlers stepped off their boats in the early 17th century, Europe already had cities large enough to create the social conditions that produced significant numbers of foundlings, as well as the religious and governmental structures with which to help them. By then, Europe already had foundling asylums that were several centuries old. By the 18th century, when the United States was just starting and its cities were still small, infant abandonment was a mass phenomena in places like London and Paris. It took until the 19th century for New York to overtake London as a center of Dickensian urban ills, including the presence of large numbers of foundlings. In the Catholic countries of Europe, and also in Russia, with variations depending upon time and place, local and national governments, often together with religious bodies, assumed full responsibility for foundlings. Accidentally conceived infants were anonymously absorbed into large urban foundling asylums. These asylums were at the center of great networks of wet nurses, transporters of babies, physicians, religious officials, and bureaucrats. This was the so-called Catholic system. Its goal was to preserve the honor of unmarried women and families by making babies born outside of marriage disappear." End quote. Now that is the mainstream narrative that this was some type of problem. But the truth of the matter is, these were Protestants. They didn't even care or prosecute people for having sex because they had brothels everywhere. So the question is, did they really just find these babies? Why the use of Lady Liberty in Artemis of Ephesus? Was it a problem that was created on purpose? Some type of operation? And what's with the references to giant babies in that one report from the Canada Lancet? It does seem that size comes to play here, as not only do many legends speak of ancient cities being created by an advanced race of giants, but the Greek gods and goddesses themselves seem to be referring to these ancient beings. The Amazons are described in many different ways by Greek authors, which is interesting because they are said to be a warlike race that would kill all the baby boys who were bound by their earth instincts and their father goddess being Ares, the god of war. But why would the Amazons worship a man god? They were moon worshippers, so it's more likely they were the original creators of the Diana of Ephesus symbol, their goddess being a fertility symbol, as although they did not allow men into their tribes, they were described as being bound to sexual desires. I don't think that is the case, but it is a mistranslation that they were attempting to repopulate with a new type of human. This is the origin of Eros, or Cupid, in which a hybrid human was created that had formed two polarities, male and female. Think about it. Remember Futurama and the Amazon women? They were trying to have Snoo Snoo? With the purpose of what? Repopulation. Now come on guys, you guys know that Matt Groening knows some deep stuff and that that is no mere coincidence. They also are giants, so it doesn't make sense that they would really have sexual intercourse with such small humans. This is just a play on the process in which these Amazon women giants created a new hybrid man in which they changed the age and added orifices for eating, drinking, and pooping. How else would a civilization of only women survive? They would need some type of repopulation program whether it used technology or not, and this is never really fully investigated by historians. We know of ancient farming and breeding facilities in regards to agriculture or meats, but what about human farming? Was that ever thought about by the ancients? If there was some cataclysm and a nation had lost almost all of its people, was it ever thought that Hey, we need to find a way to repopulate this place. I mean, I feel like that's going to be one of the first things you're going to think about when starting a civilization. It's pretty basic, but to what degree? And was there technology used in the process? If so, was it possible to actually design, in the case of eugenics, specific traits to be desired in the final outcome? All of these things are left to the vault of esoteric history. However, with the right questions, we can begin to look at these subjects with new eyes. This isn't restricted to just whites, 
as in the story of Calathea. These Montavo novels, which are actually from an earlier unknown 14th century writer during the Islamic rule of Spain, they travel to America and in California used to exist a race of giant black warrior women who also were very fond of griffins. It seems throughout history, remnants of multiple tribes of godlike women races have existed and were called to be used in some war. As for Calafia, it was the Muslims versus the Christians in Constantinople. The Amazons are also deeply connected with the Scythians, as it is said at some point the two intermarried and created a new race of Scythians called Sauromatians. Quote, the 5th century BC historian Herodotus did the best to fill in the missing gaps. The father of history, as he is known, located the Amazonian capital at Themyscira, a fortified city on the banks of the Thermodon River near the coast of the Black Sea from what is now northern Turkey. The women divided their time between pillaging expeditions as far afield as Persia and closer to home, founding such famous towns as Smyrna, Ephesus, Sinope, and Paphos. Procreation was confined to an annual event with a neighboring tribe. End quote. There were many tribes of warrior women, but I think that is just the surface level of the symbol. As we discussed with the androgynous beings, they had a different form in mind no need to eat and drink, and were essentially gods, Wonder Woman, Lady Liberty, the mother of immigrants, Athena. Well, just as the owl is the symbol of Minerva, the bee is a symbol of Artemis. The Bee of Artemis. Quote, the early association of the bee with the cult of Artemis is attested by varied evidence. It appears not only upon the strange polymastoid statue of the Ephesian goddess, but upon the earliest coins of her city. As the owl was the emblem of Athena at Athens, so the bee seems to have been the emblem of Artemis at Ephesus. Although, the extant examples of the polymastoid statue are all of late date. It is hardly possible that the type with its medley of elements can have been a late Hellenistic creation. So important was the bee in the cult of Artemis that her priestesses received the name of Melissa, or bee. There is no direct evidence that the Ephesian priestesses of the goddess bore that title, but the assumption that she did is justified by the monument cited. Another such title was beekeeper. The first priestess with the title probably served in the temple of Apollo, there which bees had made of wax. These Apolline bees must have had some relation to the bees of Artemis, the twin sister of the god." End quote. You can even see the bee on old coins and statues. Remember the bunny bee from the Cabbage Patch story? Well, the honey bee was a sacred symbol in antiquity, and civilization supposedly worshipped it for its life-affirming gifts of honey. But the bee and queen bees are associated with several goddesses, and there's never really a good reason why this would be the case. Is it possible that the queen bee is the source mother in which the entire colony is created? Our population and the beehives are the factories in which they are produced. This symbolism is prevalent throughout our entire culture, but the queen bee select worker bees and soldier bees, or has the ability of birthing different offspring to complete different tasks as in a monarchy. Each bee has a specific task to support the queen in the entire hive mind. So, are queen bees ancient goddesses? Quote, the opinion of Ramsey that the image of Artemis is not human at all, but related to bees, is quite reasonable. He says that Artemis is the queen bee her image makes this plain, and that the breasts are in fact ova. The bee features strongly on very many Ephesian coins and on Artemis images. It has been suggested that the very name of the city is from the Lydian language and means place of many bees." End quote. We refer to the sculpture as the multi-breasted Diana, as this is one interpretation by mainstream historians. However, as you look deeper, they are not breast, but they are actually eggs or ovum, making it even more clear that this has to do with some type of mass repopulation process. Located in Rome is a fountain 
The Valtagna de Triton, which is a 17th century fountain located in the Piazza Berberini, which is a life-size triton sea god depicted as a Phoenician mermaid kneeling on the sum of four dolphin tail fins. On this fountain is a coat of arms for the Barberini family, which shows their ties to bees. This symbolism is never fully explained and also merges with golden horseflies. Yet, the final symbol is the bee, which was used as an important symbol by the Barberini family and so they would adorn their creations with the symbol. It's well known that this symbol is very important to them, but why? They were the head of the Catholic Church in the early 1600s, so perhaps they knew exactly what the symbol was referring to and how it was the symbol for Artemis. Also, Alma Mater and Magna Mater are another manifestation of breeding programs. It is Latin for nourishing mother, an allegorical Latin phrase for a university school or college that one formerly attended. And in the US, it means one that you graduated. It refers to the nourishing mother, the nursing mother, the fostering mother, meaning that these schools are breeding programs for the mind in which the mother is birthing the specific type worker-minded bees. The castle on the head is another symbol connected to the ancient Artemis and liberty symbol as this process of repopulation is crucial in the foundation and structure of the new world. Magna Mater was an ancient female Roman cult. The cult was introduced as a new form. The Phrygian goddess Mater, by way of its Greek incarnation, the cult of Cybele. You come to find out that there are many mother goddesses out there, and instead of them being just some random goddess that an entire ancient city would dedicate their entire religion and life to, what if these mother goddesses were actually some type of machine or method in which you could create clones? Where else did all these orphans come from? How do you have an abundance of premature babies? We know that they had infant asylums for just this problem, and it seems that these facilities were producing these babies in mass. I mean, some of these old pictures are very telling. You see children being prepared for the new world with mud in the streets. So the Statue of Liberty is Diana of Ephesus, and it is an occult symbol, the key in understanding of repopulation. Its supposed construction by Freemasons in 1886 brings suspicion to this being a symbol on how the United States acquired its new citizens. I also don't think that they were creating just humans. They were probably experimenting with all kinds of animal to humanoid ratios creating the hybrids from myth and legend as well as the hybrid animals we know today. The Temple of Artemis is just one example, but now that we know the symbol is connected to many other goddesses, this most likely was all over the world. We see these depictions of hybrid beings from a variety of different cultures, and even the Bible says that the flood came because of the hybrids and giants that existed. Michael Tarsarian, who has heavily influenced our work, presents the Garden of Eden as after the Flood in the timeline in which our forms were genetically altered to be more material and reptilian. Of course, his approach at the time was extraterrestrials. However, what if this goes deeper than some Anunnaki Sitchin novel and perhaps we were referring to some type of advanced race of ancient humans that possess advanced technology and or knowledge of alchemy. Even the story of the homunculus and artificial man the Golem, or referencing a similar process in which an artificial man could be created through the elements. That'll have to be for the next video, but this symbolism is multi-leveled. On the surface, it is referring to some type of physical process in which an artificial human could be created. Alchemy is the origin of modern day science, not too far out to consider that they may have been considering early forms of genetic engineering. The deeper meaning and also the key to the Philosopher's Stone is that this act of turning to gold is a reference for the higher self merging with the lower self, a creation of a spiritual body of light that can be controlled and manipulated. That's an entirely different subject, but this idea of creating humans and or breeding them are not new concepts. They have existed for ages now because again, when cataclysms occur, the bulk of the population is destroyed there aren't too many options. You can either wait and build up again, 
or perhaps a method was devised to speed up the process by a couple generations. Foundling hospitals since their inception were funded by the elite royals, the choice of symbols being fitting. Are we not to question why their seal is Artemis? How were they finding so many orphans and premature babies? Well, orphanages go back to the time of Rome, and even one of the earliest orphanages that we know of is in Venice, called La Pieta, which is a convent of monks and nuns. Since its origin, orphans had been the responsibility of the Catholic Church. Are we going to trust what they leave us with in terms of this all being an honest attempt to take care of the needy? When they are the ones who put the laws in place, are in charge of the economy, and yet all these poor families have to give up their children because of the society that they live in that is controlled by these Catholic rulers? Something else is going on if you ask me. And as we know now, these incubators were right by the Fowling hospitals since they had so many premature babies for some reason. If you type baby incubators 1900s, you will first see the babies of Coney Island. But there's more to this story, as during the late 1800s, a physician Martin Cooney had begun to demonstrate the efficacy of infant incubators throughout the US and Europe. They were showing these everywhere. And it's really not that advanced of an invention. It seems weird that this came out of nowhere. Then you start having these world fairs and they're showing off these babies as some sideshow. And you could literally buy them so they were for sale. If they did this today, there would be all sorts of protest. But now we know that these premature babies were orphans or foundlings of some kind. They had incubators in Buffalo, New York, at the Trans-Mississippi and International Exhibition in Omaha, Nebraska, Chicago, oh, Jacksonville, Florida, and many more. These baby incubators were connected with the World Fair in Paris where Martin Cooney also had an exhibit. Many, those postcards may have been developed in France but the movies and images were not to promote one single event. This was a worldwide event occurring during this time and that was the reason they were funded to make the movies and postcards. People from around the world were to be advertised these baby incubators. Some suggest that this may have been a factor in the sense of multiple women giving birth, but that also comes with many problems and they actually still have these today. So that's not too crazy at all but it's very unhygienic and would cause issues in consistency. For more accuracy, cleanliness, you would need control over the environment. It would seem that multiple countries are involved in this in the modern day. And even if that is the explanation, it's still horrifying and strange that this isn't really well known. All they leave us with are occult symbols to decode. Well, I think there's even more to this story than just a literal sex factory. And it's interesting, because this subject has really piqued the collective interest, it seems. As we mentioned at the beginning, Netflix randomly released Storks, and it's at top 5 right now, so... I never really heard of this movie, but I just wanted to mention a couple things. The movie has some crazy symbolism. Well, first, it's a high-budget film around 70 million, and it's a movie about how Storks in the past delivered babies. This was their duty, their passion, what they were born to do. And it's obvious from the beginning that they have some massive postal force. They mentioned at the beginning how there were rules that you could not form a bond with the baby, to not even treat it as human, but that they were just packages. The first packages that this postal service began with since its inception. Whoever made this movie or wrote in the symbolism knows what we're discussing about right now. Which makes it even weirder that they put this in the movie up during this time on Netflix. Well, the story goes that as this postal service developed into the modern day, they stopped delivering babies to the point where it essentially becomes myth and all the humans laugh at anyone who thinks the storks still deliver babies. But the weird thing about that is they say, oh sweetie, storks don't deliver babies anymore, but they used to a long time ago. So it's not that they don't do it or they think the idea is ridiculous, it's just that they don't do it anymore 
And that's kind of where we start with the story that this company called Corner Store, which is the original postal service that was delivering babies, turned into this huge corporation. This seems to be a blatant parody of Amazon, the modern day king of delivery. Keep in mind that this movie is from 2016. The main character is a weird comedic stork that wants to be boss desperately. He just follows the system, is willing to do anything for this fake illusion of success. Well, the boss wants to get rid of this orphan girl, which that was weird to me. Right off the bat, they introduced this orphan character. That's no accident. Her name is Tulip, who is a human orphan raised by storks. The symbol of the tulip has been used by royalty as a symbol of wealth and prosperity. But red tulips, the girl's hair is chosen red on purpose. So we're speaking of red tulips. From the Buffalo News, February 28, 1897. Quote, Harvard men dined, made merry around the banquet table at the Saturn Club. The Harvard flag, a huge banner of the brightest crimson with the university's initial letter of corresponding size, as white as the driven snow in the center, floated from the staff of the Saturn Club yesterday, and it was significant of the banquet of the Harvard Alumni Association of Western New York. Crimson, the color which had urged the diners as students to ecstasies of affection for their alma mater, was the one decoration. There was about a hundred alumni at a long table which took in the whole length of the dining room. The scene was as pretty as good taste could have made it. The flag draped the wall near the head of the table, and the latter had in its center a bank of crimson flowers. This was flanked at either end of the table by the university letter in perfect formation and composed of red tulips. So for their altar mater ceremony, they dined with decorative red tulips. And remember, we're speaking of symbols. It's only when we learn to understand these symbols that a great veil can be lifted. It gets way deeper. After typing red tulip fertility, just looking for symbols, there are companies using these symbols where they advertise to grow your family using egg donors. Even specific phenotypes are possible. Now my only question is, why use the symbol of the tulip? As we know, this means that the tulip means more than just a red flower. In many ways, it represents the sex organs themselves as with the postcards. However, its main symbol representing fertility in children, specifically orphan children, lost blood. During the Dutch Golden Age, there was something called tulip mania. So this may be pretty controversial, but it's only when we ask questions can light be shed. This period involved a strange delusion where people began paying extraordinary prices for flowers and produce. And they have all sorts of excuses for why this is, but I find it interesting that this is a mainstream historical event and it's called tulip mania. I believe that this might be an even older reference to these postcards and it's from the 17th century. Oh, and get this. It wasn't just tulips that were overpriced, but cabbages. Let's remember that tulips and roses are very similar in appearance. There was a cabbage fever. Now, that seems so random to me. Why cabbages? We know that they use symbolism. Are they actually referring to something else? This will have its own video, but basically, after the Dutch were supposedly liberated from the Spanish Empire in 1581, they just began growing tulips all around their palaces and the rich began to become obsessed with tulips for no apparent reason. Well, this caused some type of economic bubble, or really some strange early created inflation. But what if it's not that these items became overpriced, it's that there are actually references to a different product. Could it be code? Quote, it is agreed that mania is a psychopathological disorder. Therefore, whoever speaks of tulip mania means the people who buy fleshy tulip bulbs have acted madly and irrationally. End quote. So they literally call these people insane for spending so much on tulips, cabbages, 
and carrots, which I think there's a big joke at play here. Not only is this the origin of our money, but look at how they promoted this stuff. It's just like the postcards, satirical cartoons, but these are even worse. Many of these satirical prints contain cabbages, showing the intimate relationship between tulips and cabbages. In one, Aesop pointed out a group of monkeys, the symbol for foolishness, eating cabbage while wolves chased innocent sheep. The title page on one play showed a satyr or pan drawing back a curtain on a scene crowned with a banner that read, Dit world volcool, the world full of cabbage. Beneath the banner is a crowd clamoring for pieces of paper in which were written the names of types of cabbages, including worthless cabbage, cowardly cabbage, and crazy cabbage. Another play referred to, quote, the company of cabbage. Many of these plays made references to carrot shares and cabbage selling. It's obvious that these vegetables were symbols for something else. Carrots, cabbages, and tulips can be seen in many of these early cartoons. In one, they're selling these tulips in a fool's cap. All of these early cartoons, which are the inspiration for later postcards, are complete with the symbolism of dark folly, or the fool's cap, or a Phrygian hat. These tulips would be sold for over a thousand pounds when one found them to be snow white and beautifully striped. Let's take a look at one cartoon that is clearly Freemasonic symbolism. It's called Ariel Quinn Actionist, a cartoon from De Groot Teferil der Dwashield, 1720, and this is in the British Library. You have two harlequins, or jokers, or mimes, that are on a stage opening a veil. At the top, you can see they're selling cabbages and carrots. But what's behind the veil? We see at the top that there is an owl, representing the cult of Minerva, and we see the Freemasonic compass, or corner right angle. Now this isn't no ordinary depiction, and I love how they label this as just a satirical cartoon. I mean, what kind of sick people make stuff like this? Why are they inserting all sorts of things inside of their butts? And it gets worse. So this cartoon is a part of a series, and these really are the only images or depictions we have of this 720 crash. Which again, you really think they were just selling cabbages? Look at the symbols. Look at what they left us with. We will break this down in another video. But real quick and then we'll get back to the Storks movie. Look at some of these images. There's no doubt that they were created by elites. Look at all the heraldry and royal symbols. But furthermore, there's mockery at play. There are too many images to go over right now, but there is one where they're introducing the book and you can see Lady Liberty, along with what seems to be a beehive with a baby angel holding a shield with two keys. The lady with the pillar is also holding a top hat, while the face of a person is being swapped, identity swap. And then we see Medusa, or a lady with a snake that is dying. And under her left arm is the bottom of a barrel, or the hive, in which people, or babies, are coming out and they're throwing cabbages. They're throwing these cabbages into another scene, where there's a devil and a crowd throwing a person into a flame, what would seem to be a sacrifice. These are the reset engravings from the early 1700s, and it also connects with other famous artists from England, but we'll discuss that in the next video. Essentially, they were using tulips and cabbage symbolism way before the 1800s, and it seems they use it as a means to promote some type of secret symbolism under the guise of satirical cartoons. And this is just way too weird, I mean, I couldn't make this up. Like, there's this one where they're literally trying to cut out the third eye, and insert these new economic systems literally into our rears as if they're trying to forcibly manipulate our new forms. Well, back to the movie. So yeah, there's this deep symbolism behind tulips and cabbages, and the writers of this film seem to be fully aware of it. So the stork has to fire this orphan named Tulip 
but it's her birthday and she's kind of cool so the stork doesn't want to fire her because he feels bad for her. He's not like his boss who gets off on hurting others. So the stork comes up with an idea. Let's put her in the old letter room because no one sends in letters for babies anymore. You can even tell that this is an older building or something and different from the main corner store building which really is just a large cargo container or trailer. Well long story short, the orphan gets tired of being in the room, basically goes insane, and she eventually gets a letter from another character in the film. A child with the last name Gardener whose parents are real estate agents. The boy is so lonely and desperately wants a little brother so he hears about the storks and writes them a letter, the first letter in ages. So finally, the orphan gets a letter and she feels that she has a duty to be the manager of this new letter room. So she takes this letter to that old abandoned building, but the story character tries to stop her from doing anything else because he lied to the big boss that he fired her already. Basically, by accident, the stork and orphan were fighting over the letter and it enters his machine. This triggers the machine to start working and it's revealed that the entire room is part of a literal baby factory. It's capable of producing billions of babies. And towards the end of the film, it's shown that this is actually an ancient castle separated from the corner store. Think about it. Corner store, Freemasons, why use Amazon? Is it a reference to Amazon women? Well, the cornerstone in Freemasonry is the basis upon which anything is founded. Hence, orphans, tulips, and foundlings. There's also a part where they lose the baby to some wolves, which made me think of the old stories of children being raised by wolves, famous from Roman mythology. The stork boss even tried to cover up this information in the movie. They didn't want people to know that they were producing babies again, because then their stocks would plummet. So essentially, a castle with an ancient advanced AI baby factory machine, kind of like Noah's Ark, was being used by the state and these storks were the postal workers designed to deliver them, but then over time, corporate evolution made this machine irrelevant, and so they no longer needed the storks. Also, they never really mention whether this world has sexual intercourse or not. They never have the birds and the bees conversation. I mean, why do we even call it that? In the Netflix movie, I Am Mother, it's literally about a repopulation center full of clones for the purpose of rebuilding civilization after a major disaster. The primary crop grown in the surrounding land is corn, another fertility symbol, and a plant whose kernels resemble honeycombs. This also kind of connects with Children of the Corn, a society of children ruled by a demon. Well, we have an intimate relationship with storks, and it's way older than the Cabbage Patch Kids or the 1900s repopulation postcards. We have more to say on that as well. But for now, let's finish off with baby farming. Now, there's only so much that I can say, and you'll have to do your own research here. But during the Victorian age, there was this phrase of baby farming, in which you had these women who owned these orphan homes where the story goes that these women could no longer support the babies so they literally would kill infants. It's a horrifying story and there are many books on this subject. It's also happened in many places all throughout the world. I do think this is a cover story for something much deeper as they had advertisements for these baby farms as well. They're from the 1860s and so they're much more difficult to find. One article is literally called Wolves and Women's Clothing. So, if this was the state of childcare during the 19th century, then why do we trust anything from the mainstream source? It's our job to begin asking questions on how this all started and when it began. Even Vedic literature has references to hybrid beings and genetic manipulation. They had a similar science to alchemy with an understanding of different elements needed to create material flesh. There's this great channel that talks about these things where in ancient Vedic temples you can see that they had an understanding of some early form of DNA manipulation, even understanding what a sperm and egg looks like from a microscope. 
There was also this other temple that showed carvings on how they were experimenting with different hybrid creatures, which would also explain why we see so many strange beings in medieval depictions. Were these once real creatures? We get these depictions from some of the most famous philosophers and ancient historians. They believe them to be true as with the monstrous races of early Christian writings. In order to conclude, this history of test tube babies is also an obscure topic. But here you go. First you get a bunch of women. You give them fertility drugs. So, they're extremely fertile. Then this simulates the development of extra eggs. The matured eggs are removed from the ovaries, and this is done with an ultrasound guided needle. Once these eggs are retrieved, they literally just put a sperm and egg in a petri dish. And you'll get some that fertilize, which is called an embryo. This embryo can continue to develop in the lab, and they have controlled conditions for this. Now in the modern day, they say that the term test tube baby is just a term to smear by the media, but this term is much older. Nowadays, once the embryo gets to a certain stage, they transfer it into a uterus or a surrogate female. This process would have been attempted at some point in the past. There are other ways that the eggs could have been extracted. The earliest reference of test tube babies is a newspaper article from the American Guardian, January 4th, 1929. Chemist will be the only daddy someday, is prediction. And again, I think this is mockery, but let's read what they have to tell us. Bosses will order employees by certain plans and specifications, Britain believes. Test tube babies would be much like nature's own. This is a theory advanced by H.T. Rhodes, General Secretary of the British Association of Scientists. He believes that there will be little difference between the man born of woman and the man compounded in the test tube. We're just on the threshold of the discoveries chemists are making, Rhodes said. We have almost finished with analysis. We are passing on to synthesis, the building up and making of new and valuable products out of the meaner ones. The speculation is therefore almost forced upon us that in time we will be able to create living material. Professor Loeb years ago in an American university announced that he had succeeded in artificially fertilizing the eggs of the sea urchin. That was an enormous step forward. We know that man, the most highly complicated of all living things, after all, only a collection of cells. We know that protoplasm, that wonderful substance which is the very basis of what we call living things, is made up of carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen. We know the way the atoms were arranged. Someday, in a laboratory, some chemists may accomplish the union of these atoms in the same way. We will then have created protoplasm, thus causing life to manifest itself. Perhaps it will not end there. Something like man. Having produced protoplasm in a chemical laboratory, perhaps man will discover some process now unknown to us by which we can incubate and nurse, as it were, this substance so as to produce even more complicated forms of life. Finally, we may produce a living, moving being something like ourselves. This may sound like a wild dream, but if you look back over the history of the last years and see what science has done, you may not be so skeptical. Ancient men of science simply collected facts. Modern men of science take these facts, theorize about the phenomena, prove their theories, and apply them to new inventions. The dreams of ancients are made to come true by the moderns. Centuries ago, men dreamed of flying, the wireless telegraph and telephone, the movies and the talkie. All the things that we consider commonplace would have seemed like black magic to the ancients. What we today dream of may happen in biochemical laboratories, maybe in 500 or a thousand years be accomplished fact. Now of course they aren't going to tell you that they had already discovered this. That's why this is propaganda. They're programming you to believe in science fiction as if this is some far away distant future. When the reality is, they were experimenting with this in the 1700s. It just had a different name. 
The article even continues and explains what the society in the future would do with these synthetic humans. Which think about it, why are they even thinking about this stuff? It just seems weird that they would even promote it. Quote, to do dirty work. Suppose then it were possible in a thousand years from now for a chemist to produce synthetic living things. They could be set to do a workday labor of the world, thus setting free those human beings naturally begotten to undertake further conquest of knowledge. So right there, that's a Freemason reference. They continue, Would the laboratory created beings be men like ourselves? Who knows? Probably not but they would be something approaching us in structure. It is improbable that they would be able to think like us. When you talk about thinking, you get into the metaphysical. The physicians differ among themselves as to what thinking and whether we really think at all. I'm not sure what that's all about, but this is the earliest reference that I could find to test two babies, and it's obvious that this is not a new subject. Well. There is an old alchemy reference, and shout out to Fire Cannot Kill a Dragon. She has some of the best old photos, so go follow her on IG. But on her page from like a year ago, after she made a post on Artemis the Queen Bee, and then came out with this post on the Cabinet of Curiosities by Levinus Vincent. Is this an early depiction of a cloning center? Let's keep in mind that Levinus Vincent was one of the most well-known Dutch designers and wealthy merchants during the Dutch Republic and during the 1720 financial bubble or tulip mania. Well, he was a part of the Royal Society and he has a book called The Cabinets of Curiosities. The wiki just says they are these small animals but also artificialia, which seems to be some artificial creations of some kind. Yet. There are no references to genetic manipulation or even contributions to science really. So what is this place? Well that's what makes it so bizarre. It's some strange collection. But even further, whoever made this knows their symbolism. So this book, Wonder to Neil Der Nature, is filled with secret occult symbols. But we can see them more clearly now. Also, if you're Dutch, Please contact us as we're looking for translators, but in this text he speaks of many different curious things. Snakes and dragons. You see hydras over 200 feet long. And the creation of the hydra, which he says is an actual invented and embellished animal. There is a depiction in which you can clearly see a man holding a hive and pointing to the shelves next to him filled with various vials. Under him are two baby orphans, and one of them is holding the Freemason compass or square. And we know this is no accident, because you can see it in the floral decorative symbols as well. This beehive is purposefully chosen, as we can also see the multi-breasted Diana of Ephesus, or Lady Liberty, with the tower or castle on her head, representing that this is some type of factory for repopulation of the new world. We also see human-like creatures in some of these tubes. Is this an early example of test tube babies? Not only that, they were experimenting with multiple animals to create hybrids. Again, this is going to go deeper into the subject matter, but in order to do so, we have to dive into occult symbolism. We'll leave that for another video. Hope you guys enjoyed that, and let us know if you have any research to share. Let's keep asking questions, and all we can hope is that our minds may be unveiled. Let go of everything you think to be true. Relax the mind and ask the question, do I truly understand what this reality is?